Hi, in this video, I will go through how to do the calculation for the determination of surge protection requirements for a class two surge protection device using the calculated risk level. And this is for low voltage systems. The purpose of this method of the calculated risk level is to perform a risk assessment for typical structures based on a calculation of known lightning flash density. That means the ground flash density for the region should be known. This method applies under SANS 10142-1, but more details can be found in the IEC 61643-12 standard. Now, just some notes. SPDs should be installed in a coordinated manner. So this means that if you are focusing on lightning current arresters, you'll have your first line protection, and then you'll have your medium protection or your second line protection, and then your fine protection protection for your devices and that protection will be very close to the devices while the first line protection will be as close as possible to the source of where that surge could take place. SPDs should be installed at the nearest opportunity to divert the surge current to ground close to the entry point of a line into the structure. We try to aim to achieve two goals. The first one is the closer the SPD is to the entrance point of the incoming line, the greater the amount of equipment within the structure that can be protected by that SPD. However, the closer the SPD is to the equipment being protected, the more effective it is in protecting that equipment. And this is why we use a coordinated approach to surge protection. So this means we may use more than one type of surge arrester. But in this video, I'm only talking about the type 2 SPD. Now, a type 2 SPD does not necessarily require that there be a type 1 SPD installed first. However, if a type 1 SPD is installed, a type 2 should follow as applied in the SANS 10142-1 standard. Now, it is good practice to consult the additional standards of IEC 62305 for full details on SPD and lightning protection. Before I show the basic calculation, I just want to discuss some of the factors which should be considered during a risk assessment. The first one is environmental factors, and this relates to the exposure and coupling with a lightning protection system and the surrounding buildings. So this also relates to the topography of the land, the shielding by neighboring structures and trees, the chance of there being lightning strikes. So that speaks to the ground flash density, which I'll still cover. And then also the type of earthing and also to mention the power switching and incidence of severity. Are there other electronic equipment nearby or on the same circuit? And some of these may be power switching equipment such as controllers, motor controllers, contactors, which also generates transients. Now, the next thing is the equipment and facilities. What exactly is housed in that premises? Are these sensitive equipment? What is the earthing system that was used? Then we talk about the economics of the service interruption. Is the structure a bank? Is it a hotel? Maybe it's a hospital. So the importance of the protection is brought into question. And then the safety. What is it that we are protecting? Are we protecting just equipment or are we also protecting for human life, medical care facilities? And then we also have to factor in the cost of the protection. Now, once these factors have been considered, one can go forward to the basic guide. Now, having considered those points I've just discussed, if you still have not got to the conclusion of whether you need the SPD device or not, now we can follow the basic guide under the SANS 10142. Now, this guide aims to determine the surge protection requirement for a typical residential or commercial structure based on a calculated risk level. The first step is to determine if the premises is residential or a commercial structure. The second step is to determine the incoming service line as shown in the diagram below. Under the IEC 61643, they have a more exhaustive method for calculating this. But as stated in this video, I'm just following the SANS 10142 as required in South Africa. Now, the third step is you would need to obtain the ground flash density from your local authority or your weather service. So, for example, I have a map here showing the ground flash density and it has a key with some measurements and the color coding shows me how many flashes on average per square kilometer 
per year. Notice that this is over an 11 year span. So having a look at some of the provinces here in South Africa, because this is the map of South Africa, we can see that Mpumalanga has a significant ground flash density. But in this example, I'm going to be looking at Gauteng and specifically Johannesburg. Now you can get the data from your local authority also in the SANS 10142 or the SANS 10313. For example, over here, it actually gives me the NG or the ground flash density for the year. And we can see that Johannesburg averages at 13.4 flashes per kilometer per year. So I have this data here, which is going to be useful shortly. Now, step four, using table Q1.1 and Q1.2 from the standard, determine if your premises requires a type 2 SPD or not. So if we have a look at the tables Q1.1, we can see that this is for residential buildings, while Q1.2 is for commercial or industrial buildings. So that would inform your decision because you will see that the measures are different. Right, let's take two examples, starting with the first example, which is a residential site. In Johannesburg, the incoming service line happens to be 38 meters as measured. Now, the solution as to whether this site would require an SPD type 2 or not is first based on the risk assessment, which I already discussed. But having considered that, you can now also use the CRL, the calculated risk level, based on the table below. Johannesburg's flash density, as I stated, was 13.4. That means that from the table, the NG is bigger than 11. So I'm using this line in the table. Because if I show you the full table for residential buildings in a suburban environment, because they said it was a residential area, so that would be a suburban environment. Because my flash density is higher than 11, I'm using this line over here. If my ground flash density was say eight, then I would be using this line over here. But because mine was higher, I'm now looking at this data over here. So in this case, I now consider the service line length, which was 38 meters. Now, according to the table Q1.1, it says if the line length is more than 13 meters, a type two surge arrestor is recommended with a current rating of 20 kiloamps. So in this case, yes, I should be installing a type 2 surge arrestor because I am sitting 38 meters away from my nearest kiosk and therefore a 20 kiloamp surge arrestor is recommended. Let's have a look at a second example. This happens to be a commercial site and this is in Peter Maritzburg in a city. The incoming service line is measured at 130 meters. Right, having a look at the solution, the first thing I need to get is the ground flash density. Now, I already got that information for Peter Maritzburg. It is 6.2. Just having a look at it on the map, that city is sitting somewhere over here. So we can see there is a significant difference between Johannesburg and Peter Maritzburg. And there we can see it's less than half the ground flash density. And now I need to look at the commercial or industrial buildings table, which is Q1.2. And in this case, I'll be looking at line two because my ground flash density was 6,2 and 6,2 falls between three and seven. Now what I need to do is decide if it was rural. It wasn't. Was it suburban? No, it was in a city. So this would be urban environment. And I have a measurement of 130 meters. And over here, it said anything over 121 meters recommended a type 2 surge arrestor, but only with a 5 kiloamp rating. So therefore, in conclusion, a SPD is recommended because the service line length exceeds 121 meters and a 5 kiloamp rating of that SPD is required. Now, if there is a lightning conductor already installed at the premises, then a class 1 SPD should also be installed in the main distribution board 
and a class 2 SPD as well. There are some requirements or recommendations in terms of installing a class 1 and a class 2 SPD when they are very close together, um, but that is beyond the scope of this short video. Right, now just a reminder that it is always important to do your risk assessment because even if there's a low risk of surges resulting from lightning, we still may have a risk associated with switching surges. These include contactors, motor control, etc. Therefore, just because the premises may be in a location where there's hardly any lightning, it doesn't mean that surge protection is no longer required. And then when choosing your SPD device, the rule for type 2 requires that there be indication. So this would be an indicator of the SPD's functionality. For example, if the SPD has already operated and now has deteriorated, the light here should inform the user that it is no longer functional. Same as this SPD, that green indicator should change color. This SPD over here is a very old fashioned one and does not have a display. While the new standard does state there must be a display. Also noting the important measures. For example, this is the maximum discharge current for this SPD. This is the nominal discharge current. And then this is the voltage protection level, UP. Uh, in this case, it is 1,5 kilovolt. And then the maximum continuous operating voltage. So in this case, if this SPD is going to be installed, we cannot allow the voltage between the live and this terminal to exceed 275 volts on a continuous basis. So when choosing your surge arrestor, just note the specifications. And if the important specifications which you require are not shown here, please consult the datasheet. All right, I hope this was helpful and thanks for watching and cheers.